Dear sisters and brothers in Christ, I am happy to join this video conference of the Lutheran Anglican Society, although you all can be sure that it would have been nicer to see you face to face in Rome. Now my greeting is coming from the Cathedral of Helsinki. It is now a little bit over 30 years when I was consecrated to be bishop here in this cathedral, and among the bishops who laid hands on my head was also the Anglican Bishop John Hind, a very close and warm friend of mine. I suppose the reason for your kind invitation is that I have been almost 20, almost 10 years the chair, co-chair of the Lutheran Roman Catholic Commission on Unity, together with my close friend William Kenny. Before our duties in this commission, William and I also chaired the Roman Catholic Lutheran Dialogue Group for Sweden and Finland. Personally, I had already in the end of 1990s, the privilege to participate in the finalizing process of the so-called Joint Declaration on the Doctrine of Justification. Let me start saying something about my personal path of my spiritual life. As many other Lutherans, in my youth I was pietistic, and a low church-oriented person. I was under the influence of these two emphases, but they dominated the ecclesial environment in Finland also in a wider scope. I guess the situation in general was the same also in the motherland of the Reformation in Germany, and to some extent among the Lutherans in other countries as well. During my university years since 1960s, the possibility to study both Martin Luther and the Catholic theology has been a deep ecumenical journey of discovery. As a result of these endeavors, I have tried to follow the words of Pope John XXIII. The things that unite us are greater than those that divide us. The things that unite us are greater than those that divide us. Surely I am aware about the controversies between the churches. I am not trying simple to marry Martin Luther and the Pope. Luther spoke very critically about the head of the Catholic Church as an antichrist. And on the other hand, the Pope Leo X excommunicated Martin Luther. Despite of these historical facts and difficulties, I am sure that behind the, these struggles there is a broad profound and solid common understanding of the Christian faith. Our Commission of Unity, published in 2013, a document by the name From Conflict to Communion. Already the title shows our intention. In the end of the document, we formulated some imperatives for the discussion on the grassroots level. I quote only the first of these imperatives. Catholics and Lutherans should always begin from the perspective of unity and not from the point of view of division, in order to strengthen what is held in common, even though the differences are more easily seen and experienced. Before I go to actual theolo theological items of the Lutheran-Catholic relations, I want to say a few words about the basics 
of the ecumenism. Before building all the floors of the common ecumenical house, we have to be sure that the groundwork and the plinth is firm and sustainable. During the final stage of the joint declaration on the doctrine of justification, it was a touching experience for me to cooperate with the famous theologian and bishop Paul Werner Scheele, when we together wrote the central Trinitarian and Christological paragraph of the Declaration. I quote, In faith we together hold the conviction that justification is the work of the triune God. The Father sent his Son into the world to save sinners. The foundation and presupposition of justification is the incarnation, death, and resurrection of Christ. Justification thus means that Christ himself is our righteousness, in which we share through the Holy Spirit in accord with the will of the Father. Together we confess, by grace alone, in faith in Christ's saving work, and not because of any merit on our part. We are accepted by God and receive the Holy Spirit who renews and our hearts while equipping, us, equipping and calling us to good works. In the Lutheran Catholic relations, we have always to remember how deeply we share the classical Trinitarian and Christological character of our Christian faith. More important than my personal faith is what Triune God has done. God and His grace come first. God is stronger than my faith. The people are only receivers. Jesus Christ is more powerful than my piousness. Historically, it is important to remember our common roots in the early church. Luther and Reformation did not establish a new church. The continuity of our common tradition is important. The basic character of the Lutheran doctrine is not in the Enlightenment, neither in Pietism, nor in Martin Luther, but in the faith of the apostles and in the faith of the early undivided church. That is the first gift I have been able to study deeper in the dialogue with my Catholic friends, sisters and brothers. Secondly, in the dialogue with Catholics, I have had the possibility to understand deeper what is the spiritual character of the Church? The Joint Declaration states in the end of the document that there are still questions of varying importance which need further clarification between the Churches. As the first topic, the Declaration mentions the ecclesiology, and other topics belong to the same area ecclesial authority, church unity, ministry, and sacraments. In two last decades, it has been clear that three, that three central theological topics are the most urgent. Some eminent ecumenists have proposed that there is a need to proceed toward a common or joint declaration on church Eucharist and ministry. I have in my mind what Hardy Meyer, Walter Kasper, Kurt Koch, and William Rush have said. I dare to say that we have already now a common and broad consensus of many aspects of the theological character of the Church. The Church is not only a human entity among other so social institutions. 
It is no, not only an assembly where the people decide what we should believe or not. The church is not an organization among other human groups. Yes, the church has a worldly and a temporal side. Yes, we have to practice the classical virtues in the common everyday life. Yes, we have to promote justice and love in the everyday life. But the church is more than our best human ideas and efforts. It is the place where God is present among us, where Christ gives birth to new members of his flock. The church is both human and divine, following her master, Jesus Christ, who truly was both human and divine. The difference was that he was human without sin. We are not. Dear sisters and brothers, this is the background why I'm not any more afraid to say that the Christian church has a sacramental character. The church is instituted by Jesus Christ. It is a visible gift to all people and it carries the promises of God's grace. According to my opinion, this is also a good Lutheran theology. The origin of the church is not a simple human attempt, however active and committed we are. The church is not an institution established by the people, not a federation based on our decisions or will, but much more. She is instituted by Jesus Christ himself. Not only the word of God, but also the sacraments of the baptism and Eucharist are initiated by Christ and handled by the apostles. In Latin we say, institutum est, established by God. The church is a mystery, which has both a human and divine nature. We should be aware that we do not emphasize too much the other side of the church at the expense of the other. Sometimes I ask myself whether we Lutherans do not appreciate the church enough. Sometimes I dare to ask whether the Catholics appreciate the church too much. The small, low church boy lives also today in my heart. The Christological disputes of the fifth century may help us. On the one hand, we should not separate the human side and divine side like the Nestorians did. Both aspects are important and belong together. We should not think that the divine aspect of the church is only occasionally present in the visible church. But on the other hand, we should not follow the monophysitists who emphasize the divine aspect so strongly that the human aspect almost disappeared. The divine aspect of the church is present only in a weak and human side of the church. A sound and common understanding of the church can be found in the spirit of, of the Chalcedonian Council. According to the Council, the both natures are united in the one person of Jesus Christ. The union of the two natures are inseparable, but at the same time the property of each nature is preserved. The Council spoke about the two natures of Jesus Christ, 
but it is, its teaching can be also applied to the understanding of the church. My question is, can this teaching of the early Christians empower us? Should we, on the one hand, avoid all kind of ecclesial triumphalism, but on the other hand, have understanding for the divine character of the Church? We all are aware that the Church has many very human aspects, as we Lutherans say, even sinful aspects. It is not possible to deny the weaknesses of the Church. Apostle Paul says, we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. Dear sisters and brothers, one obstacle between the churches has been the Catholic terminology, terminology defining the church. Since the Second Vatican Council, it has been customary to say that the Church of Christ subsisted in the Roman Catholic Church. The churches of Reformation can be regarded as ecclesial communities, but they are, according to Catholic understanding, not churches in the proper sense. Our Lutheran Roman Catholic Commission on Unity has during the last 10 years tried to overcome this problem by starting with the sacrament of the baptism. We have written a new document by the name Baptism and Growth in Communion. Our document is not yet available since it is still in the process of reception. In the document we ask whether it is possible that sharing the same baptism could create a communion not only between the individual baptized people, but also a communion between the communities. If that kind of interpretation is valid, then we have to reflect together what is the ecclesial relation between the two communities and churches. It might be also difficult to speak about the churches in a proper sense and about others who are not churches in the proper sense. I have much understanding for the Catholic opinion about the possible theological defects in the Lutheran ecclesi ecclesiology, and for the desire for a deepened awareness of the theological character of ecclesiology in the churches of Reformation. But at the same time, I ask whether the Catholic wording of church in the proper sense is the best fruitful way to describe where the right church of Jesus Christ is present. I can imagine that my Catholic colleagues would not be happy if I were to say that the Catholic Church is not the Church in the proper sense, namely in the Lutheran understanding. I can surely understand that behind the Catholic terminology there is a long tradition and many important aspects. And re I really do not want to undermine them. But instead of using the word church only in two opposite meanings, only in on or off positions, it perhaps might be more fruitful to ask whether we could approach the question from a more nuanced aspect. Perhaps we could ask to what degrees those things we be, which belong to the essence of the Church are present in our churches. In the end of our document, Baptism and Growth in Communion, our Commission expresses the common understanding with following words. 
Lutherans and Catholics share one and the same baptism as incorporation into the body of Christ and commit themselves to strengthening not only the individual consequences of baptism for growth in faith, but also the ecclesial consequences of baptism for growth in communion. On this basis, we express our hope in the form of an ecumenical commitment. I quote, Catholics and Lutherans recognize each other's communities as members of the body of Christ and commit themselves to growth in the recognition of each other as churches. Dear sisters and brothers, one common question between the churches is how we can grow together as members in the body of Jesus Christ. This is a basic question for both parties. What kind of spirituality do we live in our parishes? I come back to the question of sacramentality of the church. Cardinal Walter Kasper has in his book Harvesting the Fruits said that the fundamental ecumenical problems in the dialogue between Lutherans and Catholics is the very meaning of the sacramentality of the church. My question is, why are we Lutherans sometimes, sometimes so afraid of speaking about the church as a sacramental entity. When I was a young student at the University of Helsinki, it was an eye-opening experience to read about the theological distinction where Jesus Christ was seen as primordial sacrament, in German, ursacrament, and the churches as the basic sacrament, grund sacrament. As a Lutheran theologian, I appreci appreciate this kind of description of the sacramental background of the church. Everything what is said about the church is always related to the uniqueness of the person of Jesus Christ. As truly human and truly God, he is present among the, us in the church. The sacramentality of the church is not only a description of the church as an institution. It also challenges all of us live out a sacramental life, both personally and in our local communities. Not only the church is a sacramental body, but we as followers of Christ have to live a sacramental life, both individual persons and spiritual communities. In growing of the communal spirituality, we can contribute to the common understanding of the Christian life as a sacramental union with Jesus Christ. These aspects have been in a central low role in our document, Baptism and Growth in Communion, especially in the chapter 4. The sacramental character of the Church and way to live sacramentally is extensively handled in two Nordic dialogue documents. Together with my colleague William, Bishop William Kenny, we were together chairs in the Roman Catholic Lutheran Dialogue Group for Sweden and Finland. In 2010, we published a report by the name Justification in the Life of the Church. In 2017, Four years ago came out a new Finnish Lutheran Catholic document, Communion in Growth, Communion in Growth. In both these Nordic documents, the sacramental character of the church has a central role. 
we have been fully aware that we still have differences, for example, in interpreting the single sacraments. Speaking about the sacramental character of the Church does not solve all the problems. But we have started with the commonalities and asked whether it is possible to have an agreement in the basic truths of the Church. The finished, in the finished document, Communion in Growth, this is described as follows. I quote, The Church is the community in which the crucified and risen Christ is present and con it continues his work on earth. Justification is about growing as a member of this body. Just as Christ is called the original sacrament, so the Church may be called the fundamental sacrament. When speaking about the number and character of single sacraments, we have different emphasis between the churches. But the fundamental character of God's work in the church and in the world has always a sacramental character. All the central elements of the sacraments, sacrament are present in the church. Christ has sent his followers and apostles to the world and in that way given his mandate to the church. He has instituted the means through which he gives the gifts of his mercy. He is working through the visible shape of the church and through the church he gives his promises of grace to all of us. Dear sisters and brothers, allow me to stop here and leave the questions of Eucharist and ministry open for the discussion. I do hope we can find a basic common understanding in all the three main issues between the churches on the same basic theological conception I have described above. Thank you so much.